Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Edible Education. It's our 13th and final class meeting of the 2018 season. It's been such a great class. We have a lot of um, community guests tonight and uh, some really wonderful speakers. As you know, I've tried to give you a little glimpse into what's happening in the garden at the beginning of each class. This is an image just from last Sunday when that thunderstorm broke and we had this beautiful rainbow. And in the foreground, you see all these roses just about to burst into bloom. And for me, that's really all about potential. And that's the theme of tonight's class. It's about potential. It's about your potential. It's about how to apply and realize your potential. And following on with the rainbow metaphor, it's really about how are you going to bridge your edible education into the next st steps of your life and your career and your livelihood. So it's a great pleasure tonight. We have two very special guests, Liz Carlisle, an alum of Berkeley, and our Dean of Edible Education, Michael Pollan. So let's have a warm welcome for them. Um, it would be really great if this worked in conjunction with my speaking. Let's see if I can get that. Ah, there they are. Okay. <laughs> and a couple of announcements tonight. Um, as you know, your assignments are due on Friday, and any extra credit submissions are also due on Friday. They should be sent to me and Rohini. Um, we're going to do the class evaluation following this class tonight, and Alyssa is going to administer that. Um, probably what I will do at the end of class will end by about 10 to 8, and um, I'll bring Michael and Liz and our other guest speakers outside, out front here, so as soon as you finish the, um, uh, the evaluation, you can go out and meet with them for a few minutes. And then I also um, just wanted to put on your radar a beautiful new documentary called Look and See, which has just come out about the uh, poet, writer, activist, really a great inspiration in the food movement, Wendell Berry, now at age 83. This is just a, a, a beautiful um, story of kind of his life and his uh, commitment and fortitude to um, changing the way people think about food. So if you get a chance to see that, uh, please do. It's going to be on PBS, actually, next week. Now, for our policy update, Rohini, you're up. Hi, everyone. Weekly policy update. Yeah. Um, okay, so a lot happened in the world of food policy this week, but since we have an action plus packed class, I'm just going to highlight two major events. Uh, the first is that the Farm Bill came out on Thursday. Um, and while there's a lot in there, I'm going to highlight one issue, uh, or one marker bill, which is called the Protect Interstate Commerce Act. Um, and the reason why I'm choosing to highlight this one is because earlier in the semester, we had someone come speak to us about the Prevent Cruelty initiative that's coming on the California state ballot. Um, and what this act would do is it would ban states from taking further legislative action if there's no national standard set. Um, and currently, there's no national standard for anything on animal welfare. So it would ban, that would be one of the initiatives it would ban. Uh, secondly, um, the Trump administration announced that they are looking to reconsider joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, he campaigned really heavily saying that he would pull out of this. Um, and one reason that people are talking about, um, they're, one of the reasons they're giving that they're interested in rejoining it is because farmers are showing a lot of interest in this agreement. Thank you. <laughs> so tonight's agenda, um, what I thought we would do is spend a few minutes tonight and feature some relatively recent graduates of this um, wonderful institution to tell you their own stories about how they've kind of gone from the classroom into uh, participating actively in the food movement. So tonight we're going to have, uh, as a start, uh, Anastasia Orth and Elon Steinhardt. Come on up, give them that microphone. I will give you this. Let's have a warm welcome for Anastasia and Elon. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, thank you. What's that? 
Click that uh, little thing I gave you. Or here, I'll, I'll take it. I'll operate it. How's okay, that? That'll that's make good. it easier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's pretty amazing to be standing here and speaking to all of you nearly a decade after I graduated from Cal. Wow. Um, so I've been crashing this course virtually from my home in Davis. And, you know, throughout the semester, we have heard some incredible guest speakers talk about their call to the food movement. So I asked myself, okay, what was my call to the food movement? My call came from a book by Gail Eisnitz called Slaughterhouse, and it's about factory farming in the United States. I read this book, and pff, that was it. I said, I am leaving my job in software, and I'm going to join the food movement and help transform the food system. And I had no idea how I was going to make this career transition because my resume does not scream food system expert, okay? I've got a bachelor's in sociology from Cal. And then in my mid-20s, I did sales for a luxury fitness brand. And then I slapped a two-year gap on my resume because I wanted to be a good millennial and go backpacking and find myself. And, uh, and, you know, some of the people I tell that to, they say, oh, Anna, that's so cool that you went and did that. But other people say, are you crazy? That is like resume suicide, okay? But I did it anyways, and it was one of the best things I've ever done. And then I topped it all off with some uh, recruiting in the software industry in the Bay Area. So that's what I was working with. <laughs> and, I mean, talk about manifesting vision into action, one of the themes of this course. That is exactly what was needed, and that is exactly what happened. After hours of research and a couple of informational interviews, I discovered what I hope you have all been able to see throughout this course, which is just how intricate our food system is and how vast and dynamic the web of opportunity is in this space, and that all types of intellects are needed here. You know, one moment I'm sitting at my computer and I'm looking at my resume and I'm kind of kicking myself and questioning my career choices up until this point. And now I have an incredibly fulfilling job recruiting for the Good Food Institute, which you will learn about in a moment. And every day I get to work with the brightest minds. I get to work with scientists and lawyers and lobbyists transforming our food system. It is just incredible. So what I really want to leave you with is this one thing, and that is you are not limited by the choices that you have already made or the choices that you will make in your professional journey, okay? Because when I look at my resume now, it is so clear that every single twist and turn and pivot that I took was essential in getting me to where I am right now. Now, we have a pretty diverse audience here. So whether you are a junior in college and you're committed to your major or you are in your 50s and you've had a 30-year career in journalism or software or whatever, fill in the blank, if you want to be a part of this movement, there is a seat for you. You really do just need to manifest that vision into action, and you can have a thriving career transforming our food system, okay? So to tell you a little bit more about the opportunities that are available to you in the space that we work in, which is plant-based and clean meat, egg, and dairy, and to tell you a bit about the Good Food Institute, I'd like to introduce Elon. Elon actually graduated from Haas in 2011. He is the business innovation specialist at the Good Food Institute. His job essentially is to travel the country and speak to future food warriors like you. So please welcome Elon. So, as Anna said, uh, I used to sit in this room, and the last class I took here was accounting. So hopefully this is more interesting than that class. <laughs> okay. So the Good Food Institute, and why there are so many incredible opportunities for people who are interested in food. Uh, so we are a nonprofit organization working to create a more healthy, humane, and sustainable food system by transitioning our entire food system away from animal-based products to alternatives that are more healthy, humane, and sustainable. And those alternatives are plant-based meat and clean meat. So who here has heard of plant-based meat? An educated crowd, okay. Uh, it's what you see there on the top, meat made from plants. All right, how about clean meat? Who knows what that is? So clean meat is meat that is made from animal cells without the animals. So essentially what we can do is we take a small cell sample from the animal, we put it into a media, which is basically just a nutrient bath, and the cells do what cells do, and they grow. And the result is real meat without the need for raising and killing an animal. And the reason that's so important is because of the climate and the global poverty and the human health and the animal suffering aspects of 
animal husbandry, which I don't have time to go into. So if you don't know, then just research that at home. <laughs> okay, that was not meant to be a joke, but. Uh, so why are there so many opportunities in this? It's because we are truly at the, at the cusp of an agricultural revolution. So according to Lux Research, which is the foremost research arm looking into the space, a third of the entire global protein market by 2054 will be alternative proteins. So today that's less than 1% in the US, which makes this around 500 to a billion dollar market. By 2054, in the US alone, that's gonna be a $70 billion market. And with tremendous economic growth, there is also tremendous opportunities. And going to the next slide, we can see some of those opportunities. Oh, the slide came out kind of funny. That's all right, I'll talk through it. So all the people here have pretty untraditional backgrounds. Um, on the top left, we have Ethan Brown. He's the founder and CEO of Beyond Meat, one of the top selling plant-based meat companies out there. His background is in clean tech. Uh, he was a project manager, more or less. Uh, so a business guy. So that's pretty standard. But then on the right, you have Stephanie Downs. Uh, she's also running an incredibly exciting plant-based meat company. She was a digital marketer. Okay, we're gonna get a little bit uh, less standard. So there on the bottom left, we have Arturo. Arturo was working in Washington, DC. Not a business guy, not a clean food or tech guy. And now he's running Clara Foods, which is creating egg proteins uh, outside of the chicken, without chickens. And then there, bottom right, we have Jill and her co-founder. And Jill is an animal activist. Her co-founder is a DJ. <laughs> like, when I Googled him, I was confused. I wasn't sure who I was meeting with. Uh, but in fact, it was him. And so we can see when there's tremendous growth, there is a need for a very diverse set of skills. And uh, with that in mind, the Good Food Institute is here to help people who want to get involved in plant-based meat and clean meat, people who are incredibly smart and passionate and care about food and all of the issues that surround food. So go to gfi.org, learn about us. All of our emails are on the website. If you want to talk about a career in this, please do reach out. And thank you for thank having you. us. Thanks for coming tonight. So one of the things um, that I'd love for you to listen to in the presentations tonight is um, listen for the um, interconnections and interdependencies that people are um, expressing. Again, one of the kind of skill sets that we're hoping to develop in Edible Ed is the ability to, to kind of peer and uh, connect and see how um, things are really inter interrelated. And um, I also want you to listen for these words, vision, intention, persistence, and then also, as we've talked about, serendipity. There's a lot to life um, that is serendipitous. Uh, we try to prepare and strategize and plot, but a lot of um, what happens in our lives really is where we are at that present moment. So I think you'll hear a common theme in the people that you're gonna hear from tonight. So let me, um, with that, bring up our next um, guests. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have Amanda and Sarah come, who participated in our Food Venture Lab. Uh, they were two of the outstanding students that really uh, conceived a new kind of food business. And they were presenting to the class recently. And they, I said, what's next? What do you need next? And they said, we need an intern this summer. <laughs> and I said, you're coming to Edible Education to recruit an intern for the summer. So this is a recruiting pitch for, <laughs> and these are the Bean Queens. Let's hear it for the Bean Queens. You want to use that? I'm Amanda, this is Sarah, and we are the Bean Queens. We couldn't be more excited to share this stage, albeit briefly, with three people who were the most inspirational behind starting our business. Of course, Will mentioned we incubated our business in his class, um, but also the writings of both Liz and Michael have been just incredibly inspirational to us throughout our journey. I think I mentioned Michael in my admission essay to Haas, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and we just are so thrilled to tell you a little bit about our business. 
So we started the Bean Queens because we saw a growing trend. Across the country, in the last six months, one in four Americans have cut back on meat, and plant-based proteins are expected to reach $11 billion by 2022. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a growing backlash against processed foods. So Americans are increasingly looking for simple ingredients on product labels. And while we are seeing rapid increase in the investment in plant-based meat alternatives, we think that a lot of that money is going into these lab-based products that are not necessarily consistent with the, the goal that these consumers have for simple, minimally processed real foods. To meet this massive gap that we see in the marketplace, we turned to the simplest of ingredients, beans. As Liz actually told me when I tracked her down at an event in the fall, beans are the original superfood, both for human health and the planet. When it comes to human health, beans have protein, which everyone is looking for, and fiber, which 97% of Americans fall short on in their consumption. Additionally, beans are incredible for the planet. As part of restorative agri regenerative agriculture, they restore soils and help to uh, sequester carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere. But when we talk to consumers, even though they were really excited about beans, as we can see in the rise of a ton of bean-based snacks from hummus to the good bean, a chickpea snack based here in Berkeley, we heard from consumers that they faced significant barriers in getting beans onto the dinner plate. Two of these barriers were first, inspiration. Consumers simply didn't know what to do with beans outside of tacos or chili. Secondly, eaters really want to find convenient options. They want things to be on the dinner plate often in 15 minutes or less, and cooking beans from scratch so that they're delicious takes significantly more time than that. So we're launching with a line of bean and lentil-based pasta sauces, which include our lentil bolognese, a white bean pesto, and a butternut squash sauce with chickpeas. All of our sauces are 100% plant-based, and they're packed with healthy vegetables, and they're substantial enough to, to satisfy even the heartiest appetite. Um, but we see a vision far beyond just the pasta sauce aisle. We aim to launch a platform for um, plant-based proteins with minimal processing. And as I already talked about, we envision working with regenerative farmers so that these beans not only are satisfying appetites, but so that farms do have, see healthier soils and so that our planet can see reduced carbon emissions. So as we've mentioned and as Will previewed, we're looking for a summer intern and we would love that to be one of you. Uh, we really are happy to work with students with a diverse set of skills because there are just two of us. And so if you have any of the skills we've listed here or if you're just interested in helping us meet our vision of eating the planet green, we hope you'll reach out to us and or find us after class. Thanks so much. So inspiring, thank you. What a great through line and theme for tonight as well. Um, I'm really uh, excited to introduce you to Kamal Ahmad, another uh, alumnus of UC Berkeley, and um, who's gone on to really do very impressive things in entrepreneurship and in the food waste area. Come around here. I'm going to um, set your slides up because they're a little bit separate. But let's have a very warm welcome for Kamal. Hi, good afternoon or good evening. It's kind of surreal to be back here, I'm not going to lie. Um, my name is Komal Ahmed. And before I begin, I'd love to see a show of hands. How many of you have attended a conference, a wedding, had a lunch at our dining hall, and wondered, what happens to all of this excess food? Does it magically disappear? Does the bride take it home? <laughs> Unfortunately, in most instances, that perfectly edible food ends up in the trash. And I'm here to share how my team and I are changing that reality. And in doing so, solving the world's dumbest problem, hunger. And you know, truth be told, I wasn't really supposed to be here. As the daughter of South Asian immigrant parents, I had four very distinct career options laid out for me from an early age. <laughs> Doctor, lawyer, engineer, or complete failure. 
Well, I always wanted to be a Hollywood actress. As you now know, I ended up doing something far more realistic, solving world hunger. And the journey began for me a few years ago when I was a student at Berkeley and I was walking down Telegraph Avenue when I encountered a homeless man who was begging for food. And something about him compelled me to stop and invite him to join me for lunch. And during lunch, he sat across from me, just like you are, scarfing down his food. He was unbelievably hungry. It wasn't a ploy for anything else. And in between bites, he shared a story. He said, my name is John. I just came back from my second tour in Iraq. I've been waiting weeks for my military benefits to kick in. And because they haven't, you know, I, you don't have to play. Oh, no, do you want to play the OK, game? World Hunger, the jig is oh, up. Tried. That's fine. <laughs> but just the slides. Is OK. Fine. Thank you. Um, and he hadn't, you know, he was scarfing down his food. He was unbelievably hungry. It wasn't a ploy for anything else. And in between bites, he shared a story. He said, my name is John. I just came back from my second tour in Iraq. I've been waiting weeks for my military benefits to kick in. And because they haven't, you know, I haven't eaten in three days. And that really hit home for me. I mean, this is a veteran, someone who would give the most selfless sacrifice for our country, only to face another battle that of hunger and even of homelessness. And then adding insult to injury, right across the street, Berkeley's dining hall is throwing away thousands of pounds of perfectly edible food. And it was this very stark reality of those who have and waste and those who are in need and starve and those two people right across the street from one another. And growing up, like many of you, I was reminded by my parents, Ekomal, don't throw away your food. People are starving in Pakistan. Though well-intentioned and true, uh, what I discovered after my lunch with John, the veteran, was that hunger <laughs> exists not just in the poorest nations in the world, but also in some of the wealthiest. Here in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, one in four don't know where their next meal is coming from. While over 365 million pounds of perfectly edible food are wasted every single day. And to wrap your mind around that, imagine the world's largest football stadium filled to its absolute brim that's how much food goes wasted every day. So it's clearly not a lack of food that's the issue. It's just an ineffective distribution of that food. So hunger is not a scarcity problem, it's a logistics problem. And that's a logistics problem we went off to solve. And you know, I started by marching up to our dining hall managers and I asked them, what do they do with our excess food? And they said, well, we try not to have any. I was like, yeah, you know, homeless. And I was like, okay, well, what happens when you do? Um, and after a lot of pushing and prodding, they finally admitted that they have to throw it away. So I said, well, why would you throw it away when you could go right across the street to people in People's Park and donate it? And they said, because of liability, we don't do that. It's like, yeah, you know, homeless people's high power attorneys are standing by just to sue you. It's such a ridiculous excuse. You were going to sell this food to us 10 minutes ago at full price. So 10 minutes ago was good enough for us. And now 10 minutes later, it's not good enough to feed people who are actually in need. Like, where's the logic? And I wasn't going to accept this as an answer, so I did my own research. And I discovered that in 1996, Congress passed what is called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. And it protects all donors, regardless of whether you're a corporation, organization, or individual from any liability. And get this, in the last 22 years, the number of lawsuits or legal claims that have been filed against any business or individual has been zero. And so I printed all of this out. I took it to the executive director of our dining hall, and I said, I want to start this donation program. This is the right thing to do. Here's all the protection. I can be pretty persistent when I want to be. And so in less than 10 minutes, he agreed. And we went off to start one of the nation's first food recovery organizations on a college campus. And it was essentially students you know, picking up food from our dining halls, our on-campus events, our stadium, our arena, and then redistributing it directly to the community. Great start hugely inefficient. And one day I'm sitting in class and our dining hall manager calls and he's like, hey Komal, you know, no one came to this event so we have 500 gourmet sandwiches left over. They need to be picked up in two hours otherwise we're gonna have to throw them away because we need the fridge space. So do you want them? It's like, yeah, I want them. He's like, great, um, come get them. It's like, Mind you, I'm still sitting in class. And so I like grab my bag, I dash across campus, I jump into a zip car, I go through all these one-way streets up to our loading dock and I begin loading this food into the trunk of my car. And it's perishable food, so it's to move as quickly as possible. So I'm blasting the AC while I'm frantically trying to get these sandwiches in the trunk. And I finally do, and I slam the trunk, and I'm like, Phew, thank God this is amazing food. Of course there's going to be nonprofits that want it. And so then I proceed to call 30-plus nonprofits. 
in Berkeley, in Oakland, even as far as Richmond. Like, hey, I have this amazing food, could you use it? Hey, I have 500 gourmet sandwiches, do you need them? It's like so desperate. I was like summoning my inner grandmother. I was like, please take this food, anybody, take it, eat it. You're so skinny, take it. <laughs> And I was respond, you know, I got a third of them don't answer the phone, a third of them say, no, we're okay, we don't need any more food. And then the last third are like, actually, you know what? We could use 10 sandwiches or 15 sandwiches. Awesome, now I have 485 sandwiches. <laughs> and I'm literally pulled over to the side of the road, so frustrated. Like, why is it so hard to do a good thing? Why is it so hard to do the right thing? And where are all the hungry people at? Would I actually have amazing food to give? And I remember, I mean, one, I remember like trying to extend my Zipcar reservation and I couldn't. Because someone had booked it, so it was totally Murphy's Law in action. Um, <laughs> I remember thinking, you know, how much more effective, how much more efficient this process would be if those who have food could say, hey, we have food, and those in need of food could say, hey, we could use that food. We match these two people, clear their marketplace, and solve a real problem for both of them. Essentially, we need to create Tinder for sandwiches. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's what we went off to do. And so, you know, we started by like figuring out what our nonprofits' needs are. And so nonprofits on our platform, they create essentially dating profiles. They'll tell us, you know, who they are, what they're looking for. They just don't lie about how many times they go to the gym. Um, and, you know, what kind of food can they accept? In what capacity? What's their refrigeration capacity? All of this information is stored into our virtual mar marketplace. And so for businesses who are our customers, um, they, when they are, when they have a, pick up ready of excess food. They'll tell us how much food they have, when they need it picked up by. And all of this information is then stored and sent to our marketplace. And our algorithm kicks in and it matches this exact amount and type of food to the nonprofit or nonprofits that could use it at that day, that time, that quantity of food. It'll dispatch a driver to go pick up the food and then drop it off directly to the nonprofit. The nonprofit signs an automated digitized tax deduction receipt, which is stored in the cloud. Um, and they'll also send back photos and testimonials of the people that were fed. So you get to see the impact that you made by spending just a few minutes of your time essentially going copia. And we partner with businesses across all verticals. So from hospitals like UCSF and Stanford Hospital to corporate cafeterias like Cisco and Intel. So you think about like food businesses, so you know, restaurant groups and Whole Foods to businesses with food like the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. So a few quick success stories. Um, this past February, Copia went to Hollywood to partner with Vanity Fair, Slumdog Millionaire superstar Frida Pinto, um, to ensure that for the first time ever, no food went to waste during Oscars weekend. And you know, one of the events that we recovered food from was the Vanity Fair post-Oscars after party. It's one of the most exclusive events you could get into. And this year, it was catered by Chef Thomas Keller. So the three Michelin star restaurant here uh, from French Laundry. And you know, we took all of that amazing, incredible, bougie food uh, across town to IRC, so International Rescue Committee, where we went off to feed over 40 Syrian and Iranian refugees who had just come to America. Chef Thomas Keller's food was their first group meal in America. <laughs> And I feel like immigrants, you know, when they think about coming to America, they're like, oh my God, everyone eats like a king and a queen. <laughs> we wanted to make sure they at least could eat like Matt Damon. <laughs> Fast forward to the Super Bowl, where we recovered over 14 tons of food. And 14 tons is like four 16-foot refrigerated trucks filled from top to bottom, not with popcorn and hot dogs, but filet mignon, lobster rolls, $300 cheeses, pulled pork sandwiches, not all my jam but incredible food for the 23,000 people that we fed that weekend. And we have recovered and diverted over a million pounds of high quality food from the landfill and provided nearly $11 million worth of food to our local nonprofits. And I'm so excited to share that this year we will feed 2 million people with incredible food that would have otherwise been wasted. And 2 million people is like filling up an NFL stadium 24 times over. And think about that, 49ers can't even fill up one NFL stadium, and we can fill up 24. <laughs> so this is the EPA food recovery hierarchy, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And in it, within it, it says the ideal outcomes of your excess food is first not to have any, but we know that you know, waste is inevitable. Uh, so the next thing you should do is feed hungry people with it. 
the least preferred outcomes are what 90% of businesses currently do, and that is sending food into the landfill or composting it. And so Copia, again, uh, we are not a nonprofit. We are a for-profit company. Businesses pay us to do that, to not only recover and redistribute their excess food, but also to provide them data and analytics that help them understand why is this waste happening. Is it Indian food? Is it Chinese food? Is it Mondays? Is it Fridays? Is it raining outside so no one wanted to come to work so you have all of this excess? Like, why is it happening? And what kind of food? And we also help you unlock millions of dollars in tax savings. So, you know, it makes financial sense for you to do the right thing. And businesses can also see the, in, the environmental impact. How many people did they feed? What was their methane offset? Where did this food go? Sharing, the, sharing photos and testimonials of the people that were fed so that you, your internal stakeholders, your external stakeholders, your employees, they can see the impact that you make. And the scalability of our technology was really put to the test uh, this past October when California suffered some of the worst wildfires in history. And before FEMA, before Salvation Army, before American Red Cross could even mobilize, Copia was on the ground providing tens of thousands of meals to fire evacuees, to our first responders, to 500 members of our National Guard. And through our partnership with SF Fights Fire, we were able to provide over 34,000 meals in the first two weeks of the natural disaster of the fire. And what this showed me specifically was that the, the potential for copia is so much larger than food. Right now we're redistributing the most perishable resource there is, which is food. Food goes bad so quickly. But we could use the same type of algorithm, the same match.com style of algorithm to help redistribute medicine, medical supplies, books, clothing, because it's not a lack of any of these resources. It's just an ineffective distribution of those resources. There's so many on my journey uh, here today, and I'm sure maybe even a few of you have said, come on, reducing waste, ending hunger, that's impossible. To which I respond with the words of the late and great Muhammad Ali, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who prefer to live in a world as it is, instead of using the power they have to challenge it, change it, improve it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. The impossible does not exist, and it can no longer exist. We cannot stand for a world where we waste three times more perfectly edible food than there are mouths to feed. This problem has no reason to exist. And so I invite you to join the movement. Very similar to you ladies, we are also hiring, we're hiring interns of all shapes and sizes for different roles, and so we definitely invite you and encourage you to apply. Um, and you know, I think know that you know one girl with a simple idea can make a world of a difference, but a group of people banded together can rid the world of an unnecessary, solvable problem, the world's dumbest problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And just to think, Michael, just seven years ago, she was sitting in your class getting inspired about the food movement. This is what happens. One of the things that's exciting to me is the way this particular course has been such a hub of really um, conversation and inspiration all across the Berkeley campus. And it began in the journalism school where, where um, Michael inaugurated and led it for many years. And then it moved to the College of Natural Resources um, and Mark Bittman led it, and then um, it got adopted here at Haas. So each place it goes, it takes on a little different flavor. Um, I had one other special guest tonight who I'm just gonna, um, gonna ask to, to come up very briefly. Uh, uh, one of my favorite alums, let's see if I can, we'll go here, because I don't wanna advance too. Liz's presentation, but Allie Kelly is here. Allie's a recent MBA from 2015, and she is now a brand manager at Annie's Organics. Thanks for coming. No, thank you. And the stage is yours. Um, so, so I will be brief, as well requested. Um, I am in the, I think, somewhat unenviable position of being um, 
smushed between Kamal and between Liz Carlisle, and I have neither a um, world-saving company nor a world-inspiring book. Um, I just have this box of mac and cheese. <laughs> I also have no slides or a name. Um, but, but what this mac and cheese represents is a much broader vision for how I think we can change the food system. And that's what I want to talk to you about just for a few minutes. So first, how many of you are considering um, careers in food? OK. So that's like maybe half or so. And I was in your shoes just a few years ago. And I remember thinking, because my background was actually in, in government. And so I didn't, I, I went to Haas. Um, and at that time, had zero business skills and really aside from this burning passion to save the food system, no idea of how I was going to do that. Um, and the last place I thought I would end up is working for um, one of the world's biggest food companies. Um, but that's exactly where I am, and, I, and I, Annie's is owned by General Mills, and I, I could not be more proud to be part of General Mills, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so General Mills is a, a $16 billion um, multinational food company. We, um, we own brands such as Pillsbury and Betty Crocker and Cheerios and Nature Valley and some of the most iconic American food brands. But we also have a growing portfolio of natural and organic food brands, including Annie's, Cascadian Farm, Lara Bar, Muir Glen, and others. And this, um, this little family of natural and organic brands has a vision um, that all food can be grown in ways that restore and regenerate uh, nature. And we are simply put on a mission to lead the transformation to a more regenerative food system. Uh, we, we are a food company, right? And what, we, what we've come to appreciate even more over the last 18 months in working on this is that, is that all food, well, nearly all food, over 99% of food comes from soil like literally over 99%, that's remarkable, right? Like what about all the fish? M almost all food comes from soil. And um, as you all know, having been in this class, um, our modern ag, some modern ag practices are, are depleting soil and habitats and contributing to water um, and species loss and also contributing a heck of a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So. Up to one third of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere come from the food system, and of that, 80% is coming from the farm level. So, like, you guys know this, we need to be farming better. Um, and so, what we've set about to do at General Mills is is really to um, to define and advance regenerative agriculture, which which we define as agriculture that both protects and intentionally enhances natural resources and farm communities. So it goes beyond avoiding harm to actually generating more positive outcomes. And for us, our approach is three things. So it's, it's holistic, it's inclusive, and it's outcomes-based. It's holistic because it focuses on both people and planet. Farmers are the ones driving this change, and we need to be putting them first if we have any hope of changing the food system. Our definition of regenerative agriculture is inclusive because it includes but also goes beyond certified organic. So at Annie's, everything we do is organic. That is the foundation of our work. But we know that to impact real change across the food system, we need to be bringing in our brother and sister brands at General Mills and giving them actionable ways that they can um, start to, to improve the way we farm. Um, and then finally, it's outcomes-based because we can't really talk about anything we do unless we can measure it, right? And so we're focused on measuring three specific outcomes at the farm level. Um, one is soil health. So soil organic carbon is kind of the simplest measure of how much carbon and how much life the soil can hold. Again, having taken this class, you know this. Um, above ground biodiversity is a really important um, component of a healthy ecosystem. So things like pollinator habitat, um, et cetera. And then finally, farmer economic resilience is something that we're very committed to measuring and to improving across the food system. So with that said, um, one of our first projects is, is this um, box of limited edition mac and cheese. And um, we are partnering with two uh, organic farmers in Montana who are, who are advancing these regenerative practices and really at the leading edge of what we think will change the food system. Um, we just released these products. So you can see there's a little identity stamp. All of 
the wheat and peas in this pasta, so rotational crops, bean queens, where are you? Um, <laughs> all of the wheat and peas in this box of pasta were grown on one guy's farm, Nate Powell Palm, outside of Bozeman, Montana. Nate is a 26-year-old Renaissance man, um, super just badass farmer. Here he is on the back. Um, we made another product of bunny grams um, with another farmer uh, just a bit north whose name is Casey Bailey, which um, is a really great way of, I think, introducing Liz Carlisle, um, who was provided some of the original inspiration for this project and, and helped connect us sort of indirectly to these farmers through her book, Lentil Underground. Casey Bailey, who is our bunny grams farmer, grew, um, he grew the wheat and peas for our bunny grams and he was featured in Liz's book. So this is all a way of saying, as you consider pursuing a career in food, think about how big food companies like General Mills and Annie's are taking inspiration from Michael Pollan and Liz Carlisle and Dan Barber and Will Rosenzweig and trying to execute these ideas and then scale them to reach more people. Thank you. Well, everything's connected and it's all connected here at Berkeley. Uh, I'm going to put this here for later. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Liz. Liz has uh, got her PhD at Berkeley. She wrote this beautiful book, Lentil Underground, which you all had to treat a taste of the beginning. I just wanted to keep reading. You're such a great storyteller. And uh, your mentor best. is right here next to you. So another connection. Um, this is really rich and fertile place, isn't it? So Liz, you're going to, so what's next? <laughs> Thank you so Liz much. Liz Carlisle. Yes, yeah, so now what? Um, thank you so much, Will, and the whole teaching team from Edible Education for this invitation. I was here at Berkeley when this class began, when Michael launched this class, and it's such, as you say, fertile ground, I think, for all of us to come together and think about how to change the food system and create the world we want to live in through the food system. And I think one more round of applause for all these amazing Berkeley alums who just stood up here. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic, fantastic work. Um, and I know, some of you know that in my previous job, um, over a decade ago, my job was to stand between avid country music fans and Travis Tritt or Leanne Rimes or Sugarland, which is nothing actually compared to standing between you and Michael Pollan. So I will be succinct. Um, but I want to address this burning question, right, which we've been talking about all evening, which is how are you going to use the knowledge and the passion that you have to create the change you want to create in the food system. So I'm not an artist, but I did a little bit of artwork for you here, uh, a little bit of metaphor. So maybe your journey at Berkeley has been somewhat like mine. Before I came here for graduate school, I was a country singer sailing along through rural America with the idea that I would collect stories about the wisdom gleaned from land-based livelihoods and craft them into songs that celebrated the democratic agrarian values at the heart of the American experiment. <laughs> In the course of this work, I realized there was a problem. Oh, the industrial food and agricultural system had pushed farmers into growing chemically dependent monocultures that weren't healthy for their land, their communities, or the health of the people who ate all the processed foods made from these mountains of industrial corn, soy, and wheat. So I became a stalwart supporter of organic agriculture and went to work for an organic farmer from my home state, John Tester, who had gotten elected to the US Senate. And after working in the tester office, I came to Berkeley, back to Berkeley for graduate school with the goal of learning more about how we could transition farms to organic. But once I got to Berkeley, <laughs> so this I think is a theme of a Berkeley education, right? Oh my goodness, what's under the tip of that iceberg? I quickly began to realize what you are no doubt realizing in this class and in your Berkeley education, which is that Industrial agriculture is truly just the tip of the iceberg, and it's sitting on top of a whole host of wicked problems. 
So I don't know if you can read this back there, but corporate power, colonialism, racial injustice, neoliberal trade policy, right? We're seeing these themes coming up in the discussion around the farm bill this week. So now what? So to come back to this question, now you know that this is about more than just what's for dinner. Dig deep into the food system to switch metaphors to something a little more agricultural that I'm probably more comfortable with than boats and icebergs. And you realize that you've just unearthed a host of weighty challenges. So the bad news is that you can't fix the food system without changing the world. And the good news is that you can't fix the food system without changing the world, which is to say that this work really matters, maybe even more than you realized when you signed up for this class. So how can you reshape the food system to create the world you want to live in? And I want to echo what everybody just said, these stellar alums who are doing great work in the food system, which is that the specific roles in this movement are as diverse as you are. So if you're inspired to teach, teach. If you're inspired to run for public office, run for public office. And if you're inspired to create art or create great food, these are pathways to change too. But because the changes we need to make to the food system are not just individual changes, but structural changes, right? All that stuff under the tip of the iceberg. There are two elements that all of our work must have in common if it is to be effective. We have to shift the conversation and we have to shift power. So how do we shift the conversation and why is it so important to shift the conversation? So this is a fellow, I read a lot of his work while I was here at Berkeley in the geography department as a PhD student, getting myself steeped in social theory, Michel Foucault. And Foucault is important, I think, um, as a social philosopher. He, first of all, he was here at Berkeley, so he extends kind of the web of connections and gave a lot of important lectures here. But he focused our attention on the power of something called discourse, or the underlying assumptions and social norms that shape our conversations and our understanding of the world. And George Lakoff, who's a linguist at Berkeley, has developed a similar idea about linguistic frames that I think bears a really strong family resemblance to Foucault's notion of discourse. And both of these scholars are telling us that as humans and humans in society, we all need categories and organizing structures to get through our day and make sense of what's happening. And the way those categories and organizing structures are put together plays a huge role in what we understand to be possible and also what we understand to be right and good. So this is to say, because of this discourse and because of these frames, our conversations really matter, particularly if we're attentive to this deeper level of what conditions of possibility, in Foucault's words, we are communicating. So how can we shift that conversation? This is something I learned a lot about and learned to watch when I was at Berkeley and pay attention to, is using language wisely. What norms are we reinforcing with the way we use language? Or what new norms are we creating that help create the world that we want to live in, right? Because it's not just about being PC when you talk or not PC. You're actually creating the world when you speak and when you use language. So when you say something like, that's not a farm, that's just a garden, like what, what assumptions about where food production happens or on what scale are embedded in that, right? Something that probably drives lots of people in this room crazy, uh, right? If you say, my cousin is a farmer and someone asks you, oh really, where does he farm? Like, where did you pull that gender pronoun out of? I didn't say anything about gender, right? And so that's obviously an embedded assumption about who's the farmer, who are the agricultural producers, and who gets credit for being the agricultural producers. How else can you shift the conversation? You can be an advocate. Um, so this is something I realized when I came to Berkeley. I'd been working in the tester office. I'd been learning from these amazing organic lentil farmers in Montana about rotating legumes, crops that can pull nitrogen from the atmosphere, work with bacteria in the soil, and create that into a plant-available form of fertilizer. Rotating those legumes, those biological fertilizers, into these wheat monocultures that had been chemically dependent, and how farmers for 30 years had been working on creating these systems, not 
not just to make their farms more ecologically sustainable, but also more economically sustainable and create their own values-based supply chains, where they were going out there and connecting with consumers who want to be part of a food system like that, rather than just being price takers and selling into a commodity market. So I realized that uh, what I could do with my Berkeley education, in part, was both to learn from and understand that work, but also to stand up and be an advocate for that work and to be a bridge builder and, and go to other communities to which I was connected and say, this is why this is important to support. And not just as someone positioning myself as an expert, but rather someone amplifying the expertise of others. Um, particularly, I like this term organic intellectuals from Antonio Gramsci, someone else you might read a lot of at Berkeley if you study social theory or take sociology classes or geography classes. Who are the people closest to the change work, right? The farmers, the activists, the frontline communities, and what can you do with your Berkeley education to amplify their knowledge, rather than just sort of reproducing the notion that expertise only comes from within people in the academy, right, or people with Berkeley degrees, uh, but rather that what we can do is amplify the knowledge coming from the people right on the front lines of the change work. And then here's something really important you can do to shift the conversation, which I realized in the course of trying to tell these stories about the Lenal Underground and running up against assumptions that people held because there were these dominant discourses, right? Back to Foucault, what are the norms? What are the stories that people share? And these are the stories that I think you can share to build the world you want to live in. Right? These are things that are happening all around the world and in the food system, but that I think are not highlighted enough. One of them, um, which Komal mentioned, there is enough to go around, right? Replacing the scarcity narrative about our food system and starting there. Also reminding <laughs> other humans that people can cooperate. If you don't believe people can cooperate, it's very difficult to work on any of the structural change necessary to change the food system. And there's wonderful stories to be told. That was, for me, I think one of the most inspiring things about the Lenal Underground Farmers is what an incredible example of how people can cooperate to co-produce our common broad-based prosperity in the future. You also need to tell stories about how inequality is not inevitable and there are no disposable people, and exploitation is morally unacceptable. Because without this story, people can sometimes get paralyzed. You know, you can move into an inaction kind of mindset. And finally, I think you need to tell stories about how human livelihood can be compatible with environmental regeneration. And that was, I think, the second most inspiring thing to me about the Lenal Underground farmers in Montana. And what we've just been talking about also is, is the possibility of regenerative agriculture, the notion that in the course of our livelihoods and meeting our needs as people, that doesn't necessarily mean drawing down the resources of the planet. We have a mode that we can move into as human beings that involves living in the ecosystem as a regenerative partner with other species on the planet. And I think that's a story that's often not told, but that can be told about work that's happening in the food system right now. And when you tell these stories, you can rally people to common ground. This is a win-win-win, right, for regional economies, for health and the environment. I think the alums who were telling their stories of work did this brilliantly today to talk about how constituencies, very diverse constituencies, can come together around this win-win-win. The other thing, too, is that you can appeal to human dignity, right, to living wage jobs and healthy meals, and also to the fact that people don't just want a paycheck. They want meaningful work. And a healthy, sustainable food system is some of the most fundamentally meaningful work there is, caring for our communities and our common home. And when you engage people in conversation to this third point of rallying to common ground, you will find that most people love some place, or at least their parents or their grandparents do. And most people have also experienced something profound in sharing meals with their community and their loved ones. These themes are, are present in every spiritual tradition. So you can rally to this common ground of deep connections to land and to sharing meals, and also to all of the plethora of cultural and personal expression that we find in our food system. 
So there are so many wonderful ways to shift the conversation that can be part of the structural change of creating the world that we want to live in. But as we do that, we also have to shift power. We have to leverage our privilege. And we have all kinds of varying levels of privilege along multiple axes in this room. But one privilege that most of us share, the enrolled students in this room share, is an affiliation with UC Berkeley which is a prestigious institution associated with expertise. So leverage this privilege to pass the mic, amplify the voices of organic intellectuals and frontline communities. You, in a sense, whether it's fair or not, I don't think the world should be set up this way, but given the assumptions people make because of the privilege you have, you can validate this knowledge and you can amplify this knowledge. And leverage the rest of your privilege, too, beyond your Berkeley affiliation. Whatever it is, hold the door open for someone else. And we also need to make connections with each other. We need to be politically active. We need to follow the farm bill. We need to acknowledge the strength in numbers, connect to our kindred spirits, create new coalitions based on common problems and common interests. And this is something that has been tremendously inspiring to me through the work that I've done kind of on the lentil underground as an advocacy project beyond working on this book, is that um, it's, it's been a spark for gathering with people around a lot of common interests around both shifting the production system and also shifting access to healthy food and plant-based proteins. And as you do this, you need to broaden this movement, actively engaging your community and also actively engaging across difference. So these are my two provocations to you as you go forward from this class to shift the conversation and to shift power. But most importantly, never surrender to the belief that your work in life can and should align with your values. If you find yourself in a situation that doesn't allow you to wake up every morning and create the world you want to live in, change it. If there are structural barriers in your way, Organize with other people experiencing those structural barriers and allies and work to remove those structural barriers. And whatever you do, don't give up. Don't give in to cynicism or lose your faith in people. It might take more than one generation. So back to that really deep iceberg, this is really deep work. And we might not get where we're going in our lifetime for those of us taking on the deep work of food systems change. but we can do this. And I can think of no better person to convince us of that and remind us of that than really one of my most influential mentors, and I know an inspiration to many of you, Michael Pollan. Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a lot of wisdom in what Liz said. She went very quickly, um, but I hope you'll try to unpack it. Uh, she talked about two things that uh, I'd like to say a word or two about. One is shifting the conversation, which I would call storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't talked very much, I don't think, about journalism. Uh, so much of the change you've heard about and the inspiring stories from these alums uh, and the very fact you're here that you enrolled in this class, owes to the fact that storytelling is very powerful. Uh, it is one of the uh, key forces that's, give, that's created this food movement in the last 20 years. Um, a series of films, a series of books, a series of articles, and people out, out telling stories. And um, one of the things that was missing, I think, from people's understanding of food was the fact that it wasn't just this protoplasm uh, that you took into your body, this matter, but it was uh, stories. It was a set of relationships um, between other people that were, uh, who were feeding one another and the eater and the land. And when people started hearing these stories and they realized that their food was connected to really important issues uh, and really important biological facts that they began to see food differently and food became less invisible. Um, many of you are not old enough to know that it was only 15, 20 years ago that food was largely invisible as a political issue, as a cultural issue. It was just stuff that people ate. It gave them pleasure, it kept them going. 
Uh, and the fact that it was embedded in this whole network of relationships and, and a power structure was really not visible. And if you want to define the food movement in a really simple way, it is the making food visible and what follows from that. Um, and that's all the storytelling going on in the package. It's that Annie's box is also telling stories, marketing tells stories, chefs tell stories with their menu. I was here uh, when Dan Barber was here, and he's, he's actually one of the great food storytellers. Um, so that's, that, I, I just mentioned that as a, as a whole other area for you to think about, uh, especially the, if there are any English majors in the class, people, aspiring writers and journalists. Um, it's a really important part of this larger movement. Um, I just want to say two other things because I, I really, we don't have that much time left and I, I was really hoping to take a lot of questions uh, and, and let you direct um, what I have to say um, because there's so many different things I can talk about. The other, the other thing though she talked about was power um, and politics. And, uh, and I think that's really important. That iceberg she showed, that Liz showed, is, um, is really powerful. And one of the things I've noticed, uh, you know, we're all, everyone in this room is very optimistic about food system change. Um, but there are people who are going to fight you. There are people that, you know, have, especially since 2008, 2009, there is a backlash against the food movement that's trying very hard to defend industrial agriculture. And if you read a little bit about the farm bill that was just uh, the draft that was released just last week and is being marked up this week, you can get a really good short course in what the resistance cares about um, because uh, they have succeeded in, in writing their dream farm bill. And it's, and it's really a catastrophe. Um, and the food movement, as excited as we all are about it, is but a flea on this elephant. Um, what's interesting, though, given that the, you know, the size of the food movement relative to the whole trillion dollar food economy, is that the elephant is terrified of the flea. <laughs> for reasons I don't entirely um, understand. Um, but the level of defense, defensiveness, uh, the amount of energy and money putting into fighting the food movement indicates that there is potential power here. Um, and that where I think that power lies, and I know this is kind of an unpopular um, uh, frame, um, but I, I do think it's very important, is with a newly aroused consumer. Politics is mostly about citizens acting as citizens, true. But in the food economy, the consumer has been the great driver of change. Um, the creation of the organic industry and organic farming is really not the result of, of any help from the government uh, or policy. In fact, to the contrary, for many, many years. It really is consumers talking to farmers in a conversation and figuring out how together they could step out of the mainstream food economy and start something new. Um, it is a new kind of consumer, though, um, that I think is a very exciting thing. It's a consumer who is uh, thinking in terms of citizenship. Uh, whose decisions are not narrowly based on uh, uh, value, um, what's the cheapest food you can buy, but on values, right? Uh, on buying food, on making the act of uh, consumption uh, an expression of their values. And the beautiful thing is now you can do that. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you couldn't do it. If you wanted to make a statement that you care about the humane treatment of animals, if you wanted to make a statement that you cared about pesticides in your food, or that you cared about fair trade, uh, you know, the whole kind of menu of, of options out there, you can now express those with your buying decisions. You know, perfectly imperfectly, there, there are problems with all those labels. Um, but the fact is that um, there is a consumer that wants something different. And the reason General Mills is buying Annie's, and the reason that you know, these companies are buying these, these values-based small companies is because they don't know how to do that themselves. Um, 
the innovation going on in the food system is coming from small companies and aroused consumers. And the rest of the food industry is, is kind of like reacting very defensively, unsure how to move. Um, and uh, so I think that there's this opportunity in all this. Um, but we shouldn't um, make light of the power of the consumer. Uh, and in fact, the consumer is showing up in politics in a new way. Um, the single, I mean, one of the, the most important political movements we've seen, and this speaks very much to the how you do politics in the Trump era, uh, because I think we all understand that we're, we're in a different world where uh, in the last administration we had a president and a first lady who, who actually shared many of the values of the food movement. Um, one member of that partner, uh, partnership accomplished more than the other, I think. But um, nevertheless, the values were reflected in, in, uh, in the White House. Uh, and we've, uh, you know, ever since that, that picture of uh, Trump with the taco bowl, uh, I think we know that he shares a different set of values around food uh, and that the food movement can expect to get less from the government. But that doesn't stop what happens. One of the most interesting political changes in America is the role of the corporation and the fact that corporations can be pushed to change in really profound ways, whether the government is willing to help or not. And the example I would cite is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, and the Fair Food Program. Did you guys get into that at all? No, not this okay. year. Well, I'll tell you briefly about it because I think it's one of the most inspiring uh, political stories that connects this issue of the aroused consumer and, uh, and social justice. Um, and then I'll take your questions. So the Coalition of Mockley Workers, and actually uh, the founders of it spoke in Edible Education about five years ago. Uh, Lucas Benitez, who was a farm worker in Florida, and Greg Asbed, who was a recent uh, Brown University graduate who, who wanted to get into the labor movement. Uh, the tomato pickers in the people who picked the winter tomatoes in America in Florida in the town of uh, Immokalee uh, were some of the most exploited workers, not just in America, but worldwide. There was actual slavery in the tomato fields, okay? Immigrants would be brought in from Central America, they'd take away their passport, they'd charge them for housing and charge them for food, and they would get behind, and they were enslaved. Um, the conditions were terrible, the pay was awful, um, and it was one of the, the real horror stories of, of uh, the American economy, a really shameful situation. Um, Benitez wanted to organize, and he tried everything to see if he could get something going. Uh, he managed to organize some tomato pickers, and uh, he tried, first he tried a march. They marched across Florida to get a better deal from the tomato uh, packers, they're called. These are the people who own the farms, pack the tomatoes, and sell them to the companies you all know, Whole Foods and McDonald's and Burger King, etc. No reaction. They staged a hunger strike against the packers. No reaction. And then Lucas Benitez said something really interesting. He said, and then I found the door in the castle wall. What was that door? The door he could go through and actually get to them. It was the brand. It was the corporate brand. Not the brand of the Packers, though. Because um, who knows who those Packers are? We've never heard of them. They have no accountability, basically, because they're not, uh, that's not the consumer-facing part of the system. No, it was Burger King, McDonald's, Whole Foods, uh, Chipotle, all the brands we know who were buying tomatoes. So instead of attacking the Packers, they went to those brands and they organized boycotts, consumer boycotts, and also boycotts in front of their stores. They uh, shamed them publicly by associating them with this horrible industry. I remember once Eric Schlosser, who was here, right? Yes. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he, was, he did a lot of work to help the coalition, and uh, at one point there was a big fight over Burger King, and Burger King would not move. And um, uh, wait, I have to back up and tell you, what they were asking the companies to do was to share, uh, was to sign a pledge called the Fair Food Program. And the Fair Food Pledge basically said that uh, you would only do business with packers who, who obeyed these rules, and, and it, 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 it basically said no slavery, you know, really high demands. Um, 
it said uh, a penny more per pound uh, for, the, for the Packers, no, no more sexual harassment in the fields. There was a tremendous uh, problem with sexual abuse in the fields. And it had like 12 points. And it wasn't negotiable. It was a pledge, and you either signed it or you didn't. And if you didn't sign it, you were going to be subject to all this uh, uh, politics, pol power politics from consumers and from activists. So anyway, there was um, a Burger King was a holdout for a long time. Eric Schlosser, as a good investigative journalist, did some work and found that the, uh, the key person at, Bo at Burger King on the board was actually a Goldman Sachs executive. And he writes an op-ed in the New York Times associating this guy with slavery. This guy's going to dinner that night. You know, he's, he's got his Upper East Side lifestyle. And this was such an embarrassing op-ed for him. Um, he was shamed into driving change in this system. So um, anyway, the coalition has had uh, a great track record. They've gotten, now they're down to Wendy's. I think it's the last big brand that is holding out. Um, they've expanded this model to other industries. They're now, there's a, a spin-off organization called Migrant Justice in uh, dealing with the dairy industry where there's a lot of undocumented workers who are uh, horribly exploited in New England especially. And they just signed, they just got uh, haagen no, not haagen uh, uh, Ben & Jerry's to sign on to their pledge. It's a new model of doing politics where the focus is, and, and the premise of it is, that the, the brand the, is the Achilles heel of the American corporation. I know I shouldn't be talking this way in a business school, but, um, uh, and that the, the, the company is more afraid of attacks on its brand than anything the government could do to it because they own the government now. Um, they don't own the consumer. They don't, and, the and, and the image of the brand in the consumer's head, that story um, is, some, is, a, is a really powerful political resource that we have to drive change. Now, you could argue in one sense it's a little pathetic. We've, it's come down to petitioning corporations for change. But it's the world we live in. And this, these politics can really thrive in the, in the era of uh, Donald Trump, I believe. So, so don't uh, demean the consumer. And, and those of you who don't want to work in food and like you got your fill this semester, you learned about the food system, and you're just going to, from now on, you're just going to eat. <laughs> That's fine. But remember your power as a consumer. Remember you're voting every meal, every food purchase. Uh, for the world you want to see. And, uh, and that's not a trivial thing. Um, so you're in the food movement too, even if you're not going to make it part of your, your career. And if you are, well, we welcome you. Um, so I want to leave it there and, uh, and turn to you for questions. Why don't we sit here with Liz? Okay. So on the count of three, what do we call consumers in edible education? One, two, three. Eaters. Eaters, right. Or what do they call them in up. slow food? In slow food, they're co-producers or co-creators. Co Liz, come join us. So you know, people that have known me a long time, they say I have a, a, an ability to see the future. So I see the, the next senator from Montana. <laughs> Liz Carlisle. No, I was having the same thought. Are you? Liz has to yeah. run for office. Yeah, I was going to. And then I had this other premonition. Please meet the next chief executive officer of General Mills. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, Kelly. I mean, this is what we have to hope for. That's right. Or not only hope, we have to work for it. Work so, for it. Yeah. So um, we're going to take questions. So if you have a question, you can come here. Can I have those questions too? Don't be shy. You have a few minutes left. The first questioner gets a lemon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. Given the limited political will right now, what do you think are the most important issues that we can be rallying around to drive change in the government? I'm sorry, the most important issues? Yes, like, do you see any kind of like low-hanging fruit that if we can all like call our congressperson, we can possibly make change on, or what do you think is the most important to do? Well, in the short term, I think it's protecting SNAP. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, there's a, the, the new farm bill was written strictly by Republicans. Democrats sat it out, and, uh, and it, it includes new work requirements for SNAP, even though most SNAP recipients work or are disabled or are children in huge numbers. It's, so it's just a, 
as somebody admitted in Congress, it's just creating a hassle factor to make people not sign up for SNAP. SNAP has been a huge success. This is what we used to call food stamps. Uh, and it is under attack. Um, and I think that organizing around stopping that is a very realistic goal. Um, but I also think these, in these four years, and let, let us hope we're just talking about four years, um, I think working locally is really what's important. Um, you know, in food policy, we don't really know what will work. We have some ideas, but really the laboratory is going to be local. It's going to be the states, and, um, and the work is to be done there, I think, right now. Uh, California is a particularly, you know, fertile laboratory for these kind of changes. And so I think that the challenge is to develop interesting proposals, models, um, during this dark age that we're in and, um, and hope that um, you'll get them ready for prime time in a few years. What would you say to that? I completely agree. I have a friend running for county commissioner in Missoula County who has been the lead of the agricultural program at University of Montana running the student farm and has amazing proposals ranging from ag land conservation to food access and understands that the county is the level at which to accomplish these things. Who else has got a question tonight? I do. OK. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, assigned one of your papers, one of your articles, Michael, and you, um, a couple things that you wrote that really, I think, touch on this issue. One was you said, sustainable is now a word we must apply to democracy itself. A sustainable food system cannot exist inside an unsustainable political and economic system. And um, you know, it's just interesting to me in this, to me in this class. I think you're probably the, the most frequently cited um, person throughout the class. Everyone refers to you. David Katz came. You must be spoke. so tired of that. Uh, <laughs> David Katz came. You know, Glad you brought up Foucault, he's <laughs> although he's often confused with me. Yeah, I was going to say, you look alike. Still on campus. <laughs> um, there's actually a website that has juxtaposition photos. It's, it's, separated it's, it's at birth. hilarious. It's like separated at birth, yeah. yeah. Um, he's much smarter than I am, though. <laughs> But Dave, Dr. David Katz from Yale, he spent, I think, probably over an hour showing us uh, study after study, paper after paper, citation after citation. And then, of course, he said, eat food, not, <laughs> not too, too much, much mostly, mostly plants. plants. Mm -hmm. Which now I pointed out to you, you can see on a receipt from Tender Greens yeah, at the bottom. I know. So. I'm going to have to come up with something better. That's going to be on my gravestone. <laughs> If you spent more time at the business school, we would have told you to trademark it back then. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and you know, you did make a good point. This is the business school you should be talking about big food in. So we, we're into that at the Sustainable Food Initiative. Somebody else. Well, I mean, the relationship of, of these small companies and big food is going to be really interesting to watch. The premise of, uh, you know, uh, what Ali's doing is that she and Annie's will be a virus inside General Mills and will change it in some ways, or General Mills will dilute and destroy Annie's. I mean, it's, it's, it'll be a drama. And, um, and, it'll be, and it's not really clear how this is going to work out. Right, and um, there's some new but models. But it's a worthwhile experiment. And there's new models emerging even in governance, like when Unilever acquired Ben & Jerry's, right. they left a separate governance board in place. And um, Campbell's adopted, I think, a for-benefit uh, approach Within, with, right, with which is the really acquired plum. So that virus is, seems to be working a little bit, but we'll see how far it goes. But I was going to read one other thing you wrote that I really... Um, Can I just say one other thing yeah, about that piece yeah. you read? I'm really embarrassed when I saw that you read it because I did not write that by myself. And my, uh, for some reason on my website, the other bylines were uh, eliminated. <laughs> and uh, so that was a collaboration with Mark Bittman uh, Ricardo so. Salvador and Olivier de Schutter. And, and these four, as kind of the th four musketeers, have been writing a series of pieces about uh, food politics over the last couple of years that have appeared in different places. So uh, I don't want to take um, uh, full credit um, for that. I, I'll take quarter credit. OK, quarter credit. In that article, you and your co-authors wrote, you can't fix agriculture without addressing immigration and labor or without uh, 
rethinking energy policies. You can't improve diets without reducing income equality, which in turn requires unqualified equal rights for women and minorities. You can't encourage people to cook at home without question questioning gender roles or the double or triple shifts that poor parents often must accept to make ends meet. You can't address climate change without challenging the power of corporation and their control over the state and not so incidentally without challenging big food. So I just loved how you made all of those um, interconnections and really you've um, expressed kind of the system that we've been trying to, mm. to see and also you can't separate that system I mean it's what you said you know it's all you know the, the bad news is you have to change the world to change food the good news is you have to change the world to change food and I think that's exactly right I mean take something like um, uh, I mean let's look at the 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 the, the equity issue um, one of the enormous hurdles to improving the food system is we could, we could, let's say we could pass rules that you can no longer give antibiotics to animals on farms and you can no longer give them hormone supplements. You know, two logical things public health experts tell you this, this, this should happen. Um, and maybe that the animals should have a good life and get to go outside and a few other things. The objection is that that would raise the cost of food um, and that therefore it would penalize the poorest among us. And cheap food is, is, is now hardwired into the whole system so that to do what you need to do to make food more sustainable, you've got a price problem. And um, so can you address that without addressing wages? The fact is that the reason wages fell in this country beginning in the 1970s up to today is that food was getting cheaper. So people could afford to eat. You know, you, you could have falling wages without a revolution, essentially, because you were making food so brutally efficient. But now, now, we're, now we're dependent on cheap food. The whole system falls apart without cheap food. So if you want to improve food, you have to improve wages also. And that, that can seem discouraging that, you know, it's, gee, it's a bigger problem than I thought. I thought we could just work on this little, in this corner called food. Um, but the longer I've been working on these issues, I realize that's why, you, that's why the food movement has to raise its sights beyond sustainability and look at wages and, and, uh, and, a, and a whole host of issues like that because they're all connected. There's a question up here. Thanks for being here today. Um, I kind of had a question inspired by some of the Berkeley Glads we heard from earlier in the session. Do you see, wanted to get your opinion on, do you see consumer preferences and trends moving towards back to basics, whether that's bean or, beans or otherwise, or moving to more uh, genetically modified, genetically engineered food options? Mm. Let me add just to that question, because Sherry in the class, um, I wanted to get to GMOs, because I think that's one of the most pressing, contentious, confusing issues. So let me just add this to your question. Where do you see the future of food going when it is intertwined with science? Is using GMOs or plant-based meats a viable alternative to our farming practices? How will the current conservative environment affect the amount of research being conducted? One more question. Also, what are your views on monstrous scale mergers such as the one with Bayer and Monsanto, and how will this affect the future of how we farm? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> we have, uh, how much time do you we've have? We've got like 30 seconds left today in the class. So, Well, I, thought the, I think the bean queens made an interesting point. Um, you've got two, two trends working in opposite uh, directions. One is uh, complicated, highly processed uh, products that, synth that simulate meat. Um, and yes, they will reduce uh, greenhouse gases, and, and it's great to shrink the meat industry, um, and all that's great. But on the other hand, you're creating a highly processed food that um, many people are concerned about. They want to simplify foods. They don't want strange ingredients. They don't want novel proteins that have never been in the human diet to be in their, their burgers. So it remains to be seen how the uh, consumer is going to react to that. And I, I wouldn't be so sure it's going to be a $50 billion business or whatever that figure was. That's, it, it's a big bet. Um, and just because Silicon Valley has, has put a lot of money on that square doesn't mean it's going to work. When they, when they get out of software, they make a lot of mistakes. Um, <laughs> think about, no, think about, you know, ethanol and biofuels. That was the last big trend down there. And they blew that completely and it lost a fortune. And food may be the next thing. Um, I think a lot of them will be very disappointed at the margins in the food business um, going forward. So, so I'm just to, I don't mean to puncture anyone's balloon. Um, 
And it, I think it's a really interesting experiment. But most startups fail. Most foods, many more foods, food startups fail. And even the ones that succeed often don't make a lot of money. And, and those people are used to very high returns. So science has a very important role to play. Uh, GMOs, um, you know, contrary to what most people think, they don't really feed us. Um, they, you know, the GMOs we have, so a couple points about GMOs. You have to distinguish the actually existing GMOs, the ones that are you know, in the food system right now, uh, and the dream that is spun by an industry that is going to feed the world and make nutritionally enhanced food and, and uh, solve all our problems, okay? That's called hype. And, <laughs> and this is called, okay, let's look at what we have. So they've, and what they've done is uh, essentially created Roundup Ready crops. That's like 90% of the industry. These are crops that can withstand herbicide, okay? Roundup usually. Although as a result of putting the same uh, trait into so many different crops that they're now, we're now spraying so much Roundup on, uh, on our fields that the Roundup no longer works. Uh, and so they're moving on to much more toxic herbicides. And at the same time, this, this great promise of GMOs that it was going to make agriculture more sustainable by reducing pesticides has been shot to shit because all they're doing is, is putting more pesticide on, not less. So my biggest objection to uh, GMOs is not that there's any reason to believe that they will make you sick if you eat them. That's not what I see as the problem. Uh, although people make the case that the testing has not been adequate, you would think that lots of GMOs got fed to lots of rats before they were fed to us, and that is not the case. Um, uh, so they, they were not very well tested when they were introduced. Um, no, I, the bigger issue is what it does systematically. And um, I think the, the real flaw with this system is that it, it is a Band-Aid on monoculture. And if you've learned anything in this course, it is that monocultures are at the root of all our food problems um, and that we need to diversify our agriculture. And essentially what GMOs do is allow those fields of corn and soybeans to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. The rhetoric, that there's a really good piece that was online uh, today that I tweeted. If you go to my Twitter feed, um, you'll see it by um, the head of the Cal Academy, uh, John Foley. And he was like, myths of GMOs. Did you see this piece? And you know, that GMOs will feed the world. Actually, GMOs now are not feeding people. They're feeding cars and trucks uh, in the form of, it's a feedstock for ethanol, and they're feeding animals. That's what we grow. We don't grow GMO food, uh, or very little of it. Uh, and the idea that, th that that's what this business is about, no, it's, it's for producing lots of commodity grain in the first world. Um, and cheap clothing, too, in the form of, of cotton. Um, so I, I just think it's been a really big hype. Uh, they've been at this now for almost 20 years. They promised by now that they would have this next generation of crops that could provide their own nitrogen fixation and be you know, nutritionally superior. They're still selling the same old junk, uh, Roundup Ready crops and BT crops. And for some reason, they haven't advanced. Now we have CRISPR. We have a new genetic uh, technology, uh, which I approach with an open mind. But I think the lesson to keep in mind from GMOs, the first generation, is it's about the application of the technology. It isn't necessarily about the technology. And we fix too much on the technology. There may well be really good, sustainable uh, applications of GM that can actually help the world, but that's not what we've got. We have time really just for really quick. Oh, thank you. It is a very short question. And I want to ask about the business model question. You know, in our food system, there are many uh, business models. Maybe like some are profit, mo uh, profit organizations and some are non-profit organizations. I want to know if we want to improve our food system, uh, which one do you think is better uh, about profit one or non-profit one? Thank you. I don't think you can generalize. I think that there, I think that there are problems that you know require nonprofits because it's, it's it's hard to see a return or a business model at least at the beginning, 
Uh, and then there are you know, other ones that the best way to scale it is to, is to be you know, in business. Um, so I, I really think it's, it's a question that um, it's, it's hard to generalize about. I think, that, I think you really have to look at it case by case. Um, and that uh, you know, there's great strengths on both sides for different purposes. Yeah. Rohini, did you have a question? You get the last question. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, and I have a question for both of you. It's both your specialties. Um, my question, it may be more technical, but how do you suggest telling the story of the animal in the role of food in states where there's ag-gag laws and food libel policies? Good question. <laughs> she said both of you. <laughs> I need time to think. <laughs> you know, ag-gag laws, uh, I think they're in like 13 states, and these are laws that uh, criminalize uh, what we do as reporters very often. That, you know, that, that say you can't take a picture of a feedlot, that you can't. Um, uh, you know, if you infiltrate and take photographs, those photographs are illegal. Um, I think... This calls for civil disobedience, um, and I'll tell you why. I mean, not just because these are stupid, unconstitutional laws, but um, they will not survive scrutiny at a, at a high level. You know, one of the, the, the most unfortunate things that happened, do you remember a few years ago when Oprah Winfrey was uh, sued for, saying, for demeaning a hamburger? Um, she, was in, she, she was sued in Texas by, I think, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association because she'd had an animal rights activist or a, uh, uh, and a, a guy who was talking about um, mad cow disease on her show, and she said, that's the last hamburger I'm going to eat. And the price, the, the, the wholesale price of beef fell 10% in a day. <laughs> she crashed a market. Um, <laughs> And uh, they had laws in Texas where they could sue her for, da for doing damage to the price of beef. And these laws exist in the farm belt, and they're crazy laws because I don't know that the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is aware, but there's a First Amendment. And um, so she had to spend a million dollars. She had to take her show to Houston for a week, and she had the best legal minds in the country, and they won unfortunately. And the reason I say it's unfortunate is because she would have had the resources to take it to the Supreme Court. And it's pretty sure, even in this court, that those laws would not stand. So somebody else, equally well healed, uh, or having a strong publication behind them, like the New York Times, hopefully will get sued. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, I've hoped that that would happen to me um, when <laughs> I, was, I did a piece for um, uh, the Times uh, called Power Steer, about, and I bought a cow, and I followed it through the whole, so it's part of Omnivore's Dilemma. And I published it in the New York Times, and, um, and you know, that, the Times would have fought that to the Supreme Court. They're dying to take a case like that. In fact, I once got a threatening letter because I wrote a piece about weeds, and, uh, and the headline was Weeds Are Us, and we did the backwards R, and, and Toys Are Us came after us. And they wrote this threatening letter to the Times. And the Times lawyer, rather than backing down, as most lawyers would in that case, said, bring it on. <laughs> and they chickened out. So, um, so anyway, the ag, -ag laws are a real issue. Uh, and I, I just think it's really important that, um, th that the media uh, fight them by simply disregarding them and then dealing with it in court. What a great semester. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the teaching team. They've been so great, Rohini and Nelly, Amanda and Julianne. I want to thank Hannah and the Edible Schoolyard Project. I want to thank all our alums tonight. I want to thank Alice Waters and Liz Carlisle and Michael Pollan. And Will Rosenzweig, your thank professor. You. <laughs> thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa. If you'll spend just a few more minutes, give us some good feedback. Let us know who else you'd like us to bring to class next year and what topics you'd like covered and any other feedback for us. And hopefully, if you're still here at Berkeley or you're a member of the community, you'll join Edible Education next year. Thanks again. <laughs>